So thank you guys so much for joining. I'm super excited to talk to you guys today about my passion, which is eating disorders and the intersection of eating disorders and trauma. Um, they're very frequently co-occurring with each other. And so we're just gonna walk through both of them together. So I have no financial disclosures. So learning objectives, what we're gonna talk about today is we're gonna go through both risk factors and ideology and assessment of eating disorders and PTSD with a focus on, the, again, the intersection of both of them. We're gonna talk about evidence-based treatments for both um, treatments. And again, kind of talk about the um, controversy that sometimes plays out of how do we treat both at the same time, or should we treat the eating disorder first and then have a period of stability and then move into the treatment of eating or of the trauma disorders and talk about the complexities of treating somebody who has both disorders. So risk factors for PTSD are having a trauma exposure, right? We need that to meet the A criteria of that. It has to be exposure to a trauma, both that could be witnessed or could be told to us later that either puts our body at risk in some way or our, our integrity at risk. Being a female puts us at higher risk for developing a trauma disorder. If somebody before a traumatic experience already has a mood disorder or an anxiety disorder, that puts somebody at higher risk for developing a trauma disorder. A family history of a mood disorder or substance use disorder also puts us at risk. And then lower social support. So again, probably just not having the social support in order to kind of feel safe after a traumatic event and also having some ability to process it with people we feel safe with. People who are sensation seeking often will, will place themselves into situations that could put a higher level of danger to it. We also know the type of trauma matters that you're more likely to, to develop a trauma disorder if it's an um, interpersonal trauma compared to if it's a natural disaster trauma. You'll see that there is some of the same um, risk factors that are developing for an eating disorder. So being a female carries the biggest risk. Having a family history of an eating disorder, substance use disorder, or eating disorder, lower social support and age. So with eating disorders, there tends to be two peaks of um, eating disorders, typically early adolescence and then later adolescence is the second major peak. Throughout, throughout this um, presentation, we're gonna talk about Pilar, who's a compilation of a couple of different patients that I've treated. I learned best by walking through patient care. Um, and so this is how we're gonna talk about it. So Pilar is a 36 year old female who is married. She has two adolescent sons. Um, she's admitting to an inpatient level of care for an eating disorder. Along with an eating disorder, she also has non-suicidal self-interest behavior, mainly through scratching, but as you'll see, there's also some hitting and um, headbanging that will come out. She has ongoing suicidality, particularly as her eating disorder becomes more out of control, her suicidal ideations also increase, and she had one serious attempt when she was 20. So how do we screen for PTSD? There's a couple of different ways. So I tend to do a clinical interview, um, but there's also a lot of um, screening tools that are um, paper-based or computer-based that we will also talk about. So my screening questions are, what is the worst thing that has happened to you in your life? Um, oftentimes people will tell you about things. Um, also, just as you're going through the interview, right, you can, when people talk about, you know, the divorce of their parents, or if they bring up a, a traumatic event, um, I will talk about that, like, the divorce must have been traumatic, are there any other things in your life that you would consider tra traumatic, but the Meadows, we really define trauma broadly as anything less than nurturing. If somebody thinks it's a trauma, it was a trauma. So again, keeping that very wide based. Also wanna get to that criteria where they could have witnessed or been told about something traumatic. So are there scary things that you've seen or witnessed too? So the screening tools for children include the clinician administered PTS screen, the UCLA, um, adolescent PTSD um, screening tool, the trauma event screening inventory, all of these are 
available for free at the US Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, and they have a National Center for PTSD. Highly recommend if you've never been to that website going there, they have wonderful screening tools. They also talk about evidence-based um, treatments. The VA is just a wonderful source for um, assessment and treatment of PTSD resources. For adults, you can see there's called the SPAN. This is a Likert scale. Um, scale. There's the sprint, which is a very short um, self-report eight question one that can be used in like your office as part of your admission sort of paperwork or intake paperwork. Again, these are all free at the um, US Department of Veterans Affairs PTSD. So going on with Pilar, Pilar has several big T traumas. She had sexual molestation from a neighborhood, a neighbor from the ages of six to 10. Secondary trauma from that was her mom's reaction to the sexual molestation um, for Pilar. Um, her mom made her feel like she probably did something wrong to encourage the behavior and allow it to go on for so many years. Um, she had a date rape at age 19, and then she had a sexual assault at age 25 by three men in a parking lot. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about criteria for PTSD, but she has very few memories from this. She knows that it occurred for several hours, and she can probably remember 10 minutes of the assault. She also has a lot of little T traumas. So her father was both distant and covertly sexualized at times. There were times in groups where she would share things and then felt very embarrassed that she would share comments that her father made about her body because as she said them out loud, she could recognize that those were inappropriate. Again, we spoke about mom's reaction to the sexual abuse. Um, she was seen as the angry one in the family. She would often, as a teenager, have some angry outbursts. Um, of yelling and those sorts of things. And then within her current family, her husband has caused um, some little t trauma with how he speaks about her eating disorder behaviors of talking about disgust, um, both of the behaviors and what he considers untruths within the eating disorder behaviors too. Um, this unfortunately did come out on family sessions, which was unfortunate and helpful that we were able to have her be able to pause and talk about her reactions and help him reframe because he definitely wanted to do better but didn't know how. So I'm guessing many of you are familiar with the DSM-5 um, criteria for PTSD. So again, criteria A is all about the actual trauma itself. Um, criteria B is about intrusion symptoms. So flashbacks, nightmares, um, unwanted memories coming up physical reaction. So oftentimes we'll see this in kids, right? That they'll be playing and they'll get spooked by something or they'll have these um, kind of somatic rememberings of them. Um, criteria C is avoidance. So this could be not wanting to talk about it, not wanting to think about it. Um, criteria D is the negative um, thoughts and moods that happen. So anhedonia where people just aren't as interested, difficulties concentrating, a startle reaction. Inability to recall key features of trauma, which again, I think as like therapists, psychiatrists, clinicians, we all recognize that this is part of trauma. I think sometimes um, loved ones and family members and even law enforcement may not um, recognize that. So helping parcel that out for people can be super helpful in normalizing that this is actually part of the criteria for PTSD. Criteria E is alterations and arousal and reactivity. So for Pilar, if she expected there to be like loud noises, we have a self-defense group um, on campus that I was initially very surprised that she, she did so well with attending the group. And she would say, well, of course I did okay with that. I, I expected it to be loud. But one time um, they were all eating lunch and the dryer went off and that was an unexpected noise. And she went into a very um, hyper aroused sort of state and took her a long time to, to come back down to her baseline. There's criteria F, which is the duration, right? So these symptoms have to last for longer than a month. If it's shorter than a month's period of time, it's an acute stress disorder. People with acute stress disorder are at risk for developing full-blown PTSD. There's the functional status. So as a psychiatrist, I don't diagnose anything unless it causes functional impairment. Um, 
with Pilar's PTSD definitely was causing functional impairment, um, not enjoying life the way that she, she should be, feeling disconnected to her family, very, very disconnected to her body, which we will talk about. There's also um, the exclusion criteria, right? It can't be secondary to medication, substance, or other illness that's going on. And then there is the depersonalization and derealization one, so that dissociation sort of part of it, we need to parcel out. Um, and then there's people who with um, a delayed onset on that. So those are people who did not meet criteria until at least six months after the trauma, um, although the onset may have been more immediate than, than they would know. We see this particularly with people who have dissociation and derealization um, at the time of the trauma. So again, with Pilar, we've talked a little bit about these hyperstartle reactions that embarrass her. Um, she has dissociation. She had dissociation during the trauma and she still has it at this point in time. She has flashbacks, certain smells will bring her back, certain places will bring her back. Um, she was walking back from a group one time and there was a peer walking behind her. She knew the peer, she knew she was safe, um, but she went into a full um, startle reaction at that point in time and actually had to kind of step off to the side and get some grounding skills from staff. Um, she had a sense of worthlessness and hopelessness, um, so felt like she didn't deserve the time that people were giving her, both professionals and peers, didn't feel like she deserved to be in treatment. And then hopelessness that things would just never get better. She had cognitive distortions around the trauma, thinking that she should have done something differently. She could have prevented it. Um, these things being her, her problems. Um, Hypervigilance definitely present. Again, you could see that with how she was with somebody walking behind her that she knew was a female and knew was safe. She had very poor um, sleep. And then also, obviously, with, if she was at the Meadows Ranch, she also had problems with eating disorders. And we'll talk a little bit later about that. But she had some interceptive um, deficits too, of just not being able to feel hunger, fullness cues, thirst cues even. So again, Pilar clearly meets criteria for PTSD. So eating disorder assessment, um, there's lots of different ways to kind of to go through and think about how do we screen somebody for an eating disorder. I can guarantee you are seeing people with eating disorders or at least disordered eating. And so having some level of comfort of assessing this is gonna be very important. Again, I'm, I'm a clinician, so I really believe in just the clinical interview. Um, but if you're not as familiar, there are some screening tools that we can use um, that we'll walk through some different ones. So the first one is called the SCOF. Um, it was developed in Britain, so you'll see the stone measurement in there. Um, these questions are, are pretty simple. There's five of them. So do you make yourself sick because you feel uncomfortably full? Do you worry you've lost control over how much you've eaten? Um, and that can get to, to all different eating disorders, right? So people with binge eating disorder will often feel out of control. People with Anorexia often will also feel out of control if they eat a normal meal. Have you recently um, lost more than one stone, which is 14 pounds in a three month period of time? So anytime somebody has a change in, in weight, um, we need to assess whether it was purposeful, not purposeful, um, and what was going on around that. Cause that could either be an acute medical illness that they need a, a medical workup for, or an eating disorder, or even a complication secondary to depression or anxiety. How do you see yourself, right? Do you see yourself as overweight when everybody else is saying that you're thin? And then would you say food um, or body image dominates your life? And again, as a psychiatrist, this is how I often will get an in with patients um, of like, think about the brain space that is being taken up by your eating habits, diet habits, movement habits, body image um, plots. And wouldn't it be nice to have a little bit less of that so you could go out and do some other things with your life? The SCOF is an older measure. It's been validated. Um, we have a newer measure though that actually has better reliability, which is the eating disorder screen for primary care physicians. Um, so the first one is, are you satisfied with your eating patterns? Again, um, a no answer can, can help you walk through kind of more of what's going on, right? Well, tell me more about that. What are you unsatisfied with? Do you ever eat in secret? Um, a yes would be an abnormal response to that. 
does your weight affect the way you feel about yourself? Um, again, this just kind of offers in more space to ask questions about that. Is there any family history in an eating disorder? And have you ever suffered with an eating disorder in the past too? Um, can give you good information. Eating disorders tend to come up in times of transition. So it's not uncommon for somebody with an eating disorder history, either with a move, um, a birth of a new child, child leaving the nest, a marriage, a new job, any of those sorts of things that some of their eating disorder stuff may be reactivated. So clinical questions that I ask, again, at TMR, everybody has an eating disorder to get in the door. So mine is more trying to figure out what is their eating disorder. I don't have to figure out if there's an eating disorder, but when I was at Arizona Children's Association, um, one of my ends would be, what do you want to happen with your weight, right? Do you have a preference of, do you want it to go up, go down or stay the same? If they want it to do anything, um, ask questions around. How do you feel about your body? Are there any particular body parts that you dislike or you um, are struggling with? If you want to lose weight, how have you done this? This can get you into eating disorder sort of behaviors. If you have a, a high level of suspicion, but they're giving you all kind of the right answers um, that are leaning towards no eating disorder, you can have them kind of walk you through a specific day or typical day of eating. Sometimes this will get them a little bit less guarded. I usually will change this up and have them do it towards a different part of the interview where I'm kind of talking about like your daily routine, right? Can you just walk me through a daily routine? And if they start skipping things, right? If they're like, I wake up and I get ready for school and then I go to school, then I'll go back through and be like, was there breakfast there? Wasn't there breakfast? Um, to just get a little bit more information. Sometimes these, um, these assessments can take place over several visits, right? As people become more comfortable with um, the process, they'd be, be more willing to talk about what's going on for them. So for Pilar, um, she would skip meals, um, but she would make it look like she was eating. So she, would, um, she was working from home because she came in during the pandemic. So she would make sure that there were like dishes in the sink that weren't cleaned and put away, even though she didn't eat anything off of them. She would put food down the garbage disposal. She would dispose of food in the trash can. Um, she was counting calories. She was running at least 30 minutes a day. If she ate more than she thought that she would, she would run more to burn off what she um, ate, which is a comp compensatory behavior. She was very fearful of gaining weight. She described herself as fat and disgusting. Fear foods were carbohydrates. Um, again, she was restricting most of the day. She was lightheaded with standing. She reported a difficult time focusing both at work and within her family. She had stomach pains with constipation, constantly cold, headaches, bruising easily, muscle weakness, fatigue, irritability, and she had had a change in her weight. Um, she had lost about 12 pounds in the past three months. It was interesting that she was um, short for an insurance company, so she actually knew what her percent of ideal body weight was, but 80% is definitely um, underweight. So her likely diagnosis is anorexia nervosa restrictive subtype. Um, a clinical pearl that I often will kind of use myself is when I'm trying to diagnose an eating disorder, the first thing I'll think about is, are we talking about somebody who is low weight or not um, low weight? If they are low weight, I automatically think about anorexia nervosa. Um, and then thinking about is there binging and purging behaviors? If there's binging and purging behaviors present, then that would be the subtype. If there isn't, then it would be anorexia nervosa restrictive subtype. The challenging part is that exercise, although I view it as a comp compensatory behavior, right? Particularly how a lot of people will use it of exercising more when they feel like they ate more than they should. If that's their only um, compensatory behavior, it's not actually considered purging. And then they would still meet criteria for anorexia nervosa restrictive subtype. If they are not low weight, that puts all the other disorders on the table. So if somebody started off in a higher body weight and they lost a significant amount of weight, um, then we would think of them having other specified feeding and eating disorder, which would be atypical anorexia. If they binge and purge in their normal weight, that would be bulimia nervosa. If they binge and don't have compensatory behaviors, then think binge eating disorder. 
to add a level of complexity to this, most people with binge eating disorder also have restriction that they'll go either several hours without eating or um, they will, will diet too. I have not yet in my career met somebody with binge eating disorder who doesn't have some restriction. Um, and then we'll talk about some other eating disorders too. So for bulimia nervosa, the criteria, the DSM-5 criteria is listed above. Um, so a binge is very unscientifically defined as eating in a discrete period of time, an amount of food that is definitely larger than what most people would eat during a similar period of time under similar circumstances. So I always think about subjective binging versus objective binging. So I will have people tell me about their, their binge and it will be half of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. That is a subjective binge, right? Like a half of a peanut butter sandwich is actually less than what I would consider a normal meal. But for somebody with anorexia nervosa who's eating very little to them, they may feel like that. That would not meet criteria for an actual binge. An objective binge is very culturally sanctioned, right? So what we what most of us anyway eat um, at Thanksgiving, if that happened on any other Thursday throughout the year during that same short period of time, that would be considered a binge poten potentially. For um, Thanksgiving day though, that wouldn't be considered a binge because it's culturally sanctioned and, and most people in the world are, are doing the same sort of behavior. Um, there's recurrent inappropriate compensatory behaviors in order to prevent weight gain, such as self-induced vomiting, misusing laxatives, diuretics, um, other medications, or excessive exercise. This has got to have been going on for at least once a week for three months. Um, and then the unduly self-esteem, right, is really determined by their body shape and their weight. And then again, they can't meet criteria for anorexia nervosa. So if they're low body weight and they have these same behaviors, they would be considered to have anorexia nervosa binge purge subtype. If they're normal weight with these behaviors, then it's bulimia nervosa. Anorexia nervosa is defined above. So this is persistent restriction of energy intake leading to significantly low body weight. Um, which may be for adolescents not gaining weight appropriately. It may not necessarily be losing weight. Um, that is not appropriate for kind of where they are in terms of their physical health. The percentage of like where they actually need to be was taken out of the DSM-5, which is very appreciative. Um, the other thing that was also taken out was amenorrhea, which again is super appreciated. They also have to have an intense fear of weight gain or fear of becoming fat. And then they have persistent behavior that interferes with weight gain, even though they're at a significantly low um, body weight. They also have body image, um, like they don't see themselves the way everybody else sees themselves. And then again, based on the primary behavior that's going on, if it's primarily restrictive eating or over-exercising, it would be a restrictive subtype. If they have binging or purging, then it would be binge purge subtype. Um, Sorry, yes. we just have one. Um, we have a question if this is okay right now. Yeah, of course. Um, would spontaneous vomiting in response to stress ever meet criteria for purging? Potentially. Um, and we have a we have a lot of that. Um, so kind of defining going through um, how they're doing it, if it's interfering with their functionality, right? And if it's causing either medical complications or life complications then we could call it purging disorder. It would be other specified feeding and eating disorder, purging disorder, right? And we would know that it may not necessarily be because of weight concerns, um, but we need to address it because it's a dangerous behavior on its own too. So excellent question. Um, one thing I forgot to talk about is just prevalence. So anorexia nervosa, um, the prevalence is about um, half of a percentage of people at any given time are struggling with this definitely a predominance of females versus males. We don't have, we have old studies um, that say it's about 10 females to every one male. For bulimia nervosa, that's almost 1% of the population who struggles with this at any given time. And then the next disorder, binge eating disorder, is um, the most frequent eating disorder. So three to 5% of the population at any given time is struggling with this. Um, you can see that they, they try to define out a binge more specifically, um, and they talk about behaviors that are associated with the binge. So eating more rapidly, eating past the point of feeling full, eating 
food, even when not feeling um, physically hungry, having feelings around eating food, right? Having guilt, shame, embarrassment, eating by oneself feeling disgusted with oneself afterwards, depressed or very guilty afterwards. This has to happen at least once a week for three months. Um, and within the, there can't be compensatory behaviors, again, other than restriction. So oftentimes I'll see people binge eat, um, but they will restrict throughout the entire day and won't, won't eat anything. Then they'll get home from work or, or school and eat at that point in time, or they have period the time that they're more vulnerable to having um, a binge eating episode. Um, males and females are equally at risk for this. Bulimia nervosa um, and anorexia nervosa tend to develop with an adolescent period of time. So again, um, somewhere between 18 and 20-ish, corresponding to those transitions in life. Binge eating disorder appears can develop later on in life also, um, that there doesn't seem to be as much of um, a developmentally time that this can happen. It should be noted that binge eating disorder was a research criteria before the DSM-5. And so we are still just kind of learning about things and still getting more data about this eating disorder. So other specified feeding and eating disorder, this is where a lot of the disorders that don't quite meet the time criteria, right? So, or meet this, um, the weight criteria would go. So atypical anorexia nervosa would go here, bulimia nervosa in a sufficient time or um, behavior, right? So if it's happening once every two weeks for two months, then we could put it here. This is where purging disorder would go. This would be where night eating disorder would go. Unspecified eating disorder is where the behaviors are kind of confusing or they don't quite line up with any specific diagnosis, but we know there's an eating problem. There's also avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. Sometimes for people with trauma, we can also find that they meet criteria for, for this one, right? That they had a traumatic event and they just absolutely lost their appetite or there was trauma involved with foods and now they can't eat certain textures of foods that are going on or foods that they associate with the trauma um, or they don't like food being in their mouth at all, depending on the trauma, but they don't have any body weight concerns um, or shape concerns, but they're still having some of the medical complications, then we, we would call that avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. Any Dr. Garber? Oh, yeah, sorry. Yes. No, I was a... just gonna open it up to questions. Oh, perfect, yay. <laughs> um, so the first question is, do you screen and treat for orthorexia? Yeah, so orthorexia isn't a formal diagnosis, right? Um, but what we find is a lot of people with eating disorders have something called orthorexia. And orthorexia is, it can take a couple of different forms um, depending on, on people. But these are people who don't necessarily have the food or don't have the body shape concerns that other people will have, but they really limit their intake of food based on their principles of whatever healthy eating will be or clean eating will be. So maybe they don't eat any processed foods um, or they don't eat any sugar. Um, so yes, absolutely. We have to screen for orthorexia because we as a treatment facility are an all foods fit um, philosophy. And so we want people to be able to nourish their bodies in every different kind of way. And as we all know, there are times when the only food available to us is a packaged meal, right? Or we're at a conference and the only thing available to us is, um, you know, a sugary cookie and we have to get our meal plan exchanges in. Okay. Awesome. Uh, the second one is, are large amounts of food subjective? Absolutely. Right. That's why we talk about, um, like specific behaviors of what they do, because to get to an actual binge, it has to be that very well-defined, right? Um, tongue in cheek about a, a much larger portion than what a typical person would eat during that period of time. So yes, it's absolutely subjective and we have to use our best clinical judgment on, on that, um, which, um, which can sometimes be challenging to figure out if it actually is a larger amount of food than a typical person would eat at a period of time. Okay, and let's see, we have two more. I'm curious about how you handle intermittent fasting. It seems to be more popular and I've seen clients use it as an avoidance or justification tactic. 
Yeah, absolutely. So again, I want to be very, very open that like everybody I treat at this point in time in my life has an eating disorder, right? So I am a very staunch um, proponent of none of my patients because they have an eating disorder should be intermittently fasting. Absolutely. It's for my patients who I know have an eating disorder. It is definitely um, a justification for their behaviors. Um, it also, we know for people with eating disorders that it's a brain disorder. And so people who go into negative energy balance with eating disorder risk factors, there's something that just changes in their brain. And then here we are back again within a relapse. So absolutely for people who are vulnerable to eating disorders, fully recommend not doing intermittent fasting. It's the same thing as with sleep, right? That if somebody has no sleep issues and some of the things that we tell people for sleep hygiene may not apply, right? If you are a great sleeper, and then you can watch TV right before you go to bed and maybe you don't have to figure out exactly what time your, your caffeine place is of you have to cut it off. Same thing with food, right? If you've never struggled with food, you've never struggled with an eating disorder, then, then do what it is that you wanna do with it. If you're at risk though for an eating disorder, people have got to be really, really careful. Let's see. The next question is binge eating disorder does not require purging or vomiting. Correct. Um, so binge eating disorder, the, the criteria is the actual binge eating, right? Because as soon as you have purging, um, that takes you into bulimia nervosa. And then the last question is how would you define disordered eating as opposed to an eating disorder? Good question. So it, Disordered eating um, would not be causing dysfunction yet, right? So we wouldn't be having medical complications. We wouldn't be having the functionality decrease, right? Where they're spending all of their time thinking about what, or a good amount of their time thinking about what they are or are not going to eat. They're still getting adequate kind of number and types of nutrients in, but it's, it's a slippery slope. And very honestly, right, within American culture, dieting and um, wellness and all of those things are kind of ubiquitous, right? And a very small percentage of the population actually goes on to developing an eating disorder. Um, so I always think about it in terms of functionality. Great. That is all the questions for now. Is cool. it better for you if you just pause and say any questions and then I throw them in there? Or do you prefer me to interrupt you when you're like at that section? Um, so I truly am, am good either way. Um, awesome. So whatever works best. Cool. Thank you. No problem. So next we'll move on to talking about trauma and eating disorders. So within the general population, lifetime prevalence rates of PTSD, so this is a traumatic event that led to PTSD, is about 5 to 12% of the population. Prevalence of traumatic events, depending on the study that you look at, um, are about a third of people with eating disorders will have a trauma, all the way up to 100% of patients will have a trauma. Um, the prevalence of having PTSD for somebody with bulimia is about 37 to 45%, depending on the study. For binge eating disorder, the co-occurring PTSD rates are about 20 to 26% of the population. Again, I always caution with anything with binge eating disorder, just because it, again, is a newer formal diagnosis. So I don't, I'm always cautious about how good is the research that we actually have. And then for anorexia nervosa, the prevalence rate is about 25% um, of patients will also meet criteria for PTSD. So you can see there's a large amount of overlap between patients with eating disorders and also having a co-recurring PTSD um, diagnosis. So trauma and eating disorders, um, we know that, that people who ha have trauma are at higher risk for developing eating disorders in all populations. So based on age and gender, we know that Multiple episodes of trauma are more associated with developing an eating disorder. So if we go back and think about Pilar, she had um, sexual trauma that was ongoing multiple times between the age of six and um, 10. She also had a date rape and then she had um, a sexual assault um, that was going on too. Um, we know that trauma in terms of eating disorder behaviors is more associated with binging and purging behaviors than restrictive behaviors. But as we saw before, 
it can develop into, into either. Trauma is associated with greater comorbidity in patients with eating disorders. So this means that they're more likely to meet criteria for a mood disorder, anxiety disorder, substance use disorder, in addition to their PTSD and with their, um, their eating disorder. The research has had mixed results in terms of high PTSD rates being um, correlated with the severity though of their eating disorder. So it's some studies show that, you know, higher PTSD symptoms are associated with higher um, eating disorder pathology and some have not shown that, that relationship. So we know that having another diagnosis besides just an eating disorder changes the way the eating disorder is treated and how easy it is to treat. So PTSD is a risk factor for early termination of treatment, of just leaving treatment. Oftentimes people with co-occurring disorders have higher repeated inpatient or residential treatments. They're often be unwilling or unable to meet behavioral requirements um, in order to do the trauma work. And treatment providers often recognize that these patients are just more challenging to treat. So what's like, what is the cause of this, right? Or what are some mediators that, that we may see? So we know that trauma um, just can kind of take down all of our resiliency, right? Um, it may take a lot of resiliency and coping to cope with the trauma that we let our eating go um, by the wayside for a period of time. We also know that trauma has an impact on how we see ourselves and a coherent kind of narrative and how we function throughout the world. We also know that one big part of trauma, it's actually part of the DSM-5 criteria is avoidance, right? And so we may avoid social interactions that could give us some of the support that we need. Um, again, those with less social support are less or more likely to develop an eating disorder and PTSD um, throughout their, their treatment. Um, other mediators is that we know trauma leads to more emotional dysregulation, right? With more poor coping skill use, we can just kind of, as we become more and more dysregulated, our ability to like think and mindfully put into place the coping skills that we know are effective can decrease. And so we may go to maladaptive coping skills, such as eating disorder behaviors. Um, particularly with over-exercising, sometimes people will feel more empowered with exercising. Sometimes people will feel like they're stronger with exercising. We also know that exercising leads to neurochemical changes in our brains, which can help alleviate anxiety. We often see that people with trauma have negative cognitions about their self and body, right? So some people may want to become bigger um, and they may feel like they would be less attractive. Polaris was the opposite. Um, she was assaulted in adulthood at, at, at a normal weight. And so she, when she would approach normal weight, she would always um, unconsciously become more aware of her body and feel more vulnerable. Um, we know eating disorder behaviors facilitate numbness and escape from kind of current situations. Um, and we know that eating disorder behaviors um, also decrease arousal, right? That people feel numb when they're engaging in eating disorder behaviors. If they are doing these behaviors and they're actually causing a negative energy balance, it actually causes, again, neurochemical changes and neuroscience um, changes within their brains that will facilitate the decrease of arousal symptoms, which feels reinforcing um, for people with trauma. Any questions about trauma? Not specifically trauma, but some other questions here. Okay. Uh, first one. So binge eating is a disorder because of functional impairment question. Some college students, professionals eat on the fly or a lot of food due to lack of time. But is that really a disorder? I'm a bit confused about this new disorder. So with binge eating disorder, you have to be distressed by it, right? So if you are a busy college student and you go all day without eating and then you eat in your car going to a meeting and again, it's five, six, seven, eight o'clock at night and you haven't had anything to eat and you have a full meal and maybe you have an additional side or, or those sorts of things, 
and it doesn't bother you, right? Like you're still eating at a normal pace and you're still, um, you don't feel bad about it. You don't feel guilty about it. You don't have any emotional kind of, of assignments to it. Then no, that, that wouldn't be a binge eating. All DSM-5 diagnoses, there has to be functional impairment, right? So again, if you're eating all of your calories at one particular time and you don't have body image concerns, you're not eating faster than normal, you don't have guilt for eating, that's not a disorder. It becomes a disorder when people could do that same behavior, but they have the feelings around it. Okay. Let's see. The next one is how does a person with autism appear in the statistics for experiencing an eating disorder? There are sensory issues around food. So I was wondering if the instances were higher or similar to the norm. And off the the top of my head, I don't have access to the rates. I do know that we often will see patients who have both. um, And you're you're absolutely right that they will have sensory issues with food. Um, We also, um, like one of the screening questions when I'm asking people about autism is that oftentimes kids will have GI problems with autism that we don't fully understand why that is. So we do know that they both can kind of co-occur together. Often it's um, more of a restrictive type of eating disorder. So that avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, oftentimes we will see that with kids in autism struggling with textures of food or even the look of certain foods too. Okay. Uh, The next one is, is the prevalence of fasting as a diet aid having an impact on eating disorders? Probably not. Um, It probably is changing maybe some of what we're seeing in terms of eating disorder behaviors. Um, And again, I think it, it can be a nice hiding tool initially that people sometimes even within the medical community will not pick up on the, the intermittent fasting as an eating disorder behavior, but I don't think it's actually changing the rates of eating disorders. All right. Is there any research on the prevalence of eating disorders in the transgender population or the LGBTQ plus IA population? Yep. Um, thankfully, we are starting to do that research. What we are seeing is that the rates of eating disorders are actually higher in those populations. Um, some of the complexities around that are around how they want to change their bodies. Um, sometimes they're using it as a way to prevent pubertal changes that are going on. Um, the expectations sometimes that society has or they have themselves about how body should look within those different populations too. But yes, there's, there's good research on that now. Let's see. The next one is what do you mean by coherence? So that sense of that coherence, both physically of like, I am here, I am present, this is my body, um, and coherence in terms of my narrative across time. Um, So a a narrative of who I am, what I've experienced, and what I can kind of put up with and handle, and trauma will often shake our core of that, right? That we we don't trust our bodies after trauma. We... Um, maybe our bodies responded in a way that we we didn't expect during a trauma. Um, it definitely can change the self-image and the story we tell ourselves, right? It definitely can make people feel vulnerable. And maybe that wasn't their initial um, narrative that they had about themselves. It also changes the way that we see the world too, that the world is now can be unpredictable and scary. Definitely. Uh, Let's see here. For patients who have extreme fear of weight gain and poor body image, do you have any suggestions or strategies on how to challenge their resistance or any reading materials to help work through shifting their values and thoughts around their body? Yep. Um, So as as I think you were maybe alluding to the questionnaire, um, so we use a lot of ACT stuff, right, of taking away the focus of trying necessarily to change body image, but to accept their body where it is right now and what are their values and how to live a valuesful life despite initially struggling with their body image, right? So maybe their values, they wanna take a vacation with their family to the beach and they wanna swim in the ocean with their kiddos. Their body image may make that really hard. And so what 
what ACT would teach us to do is to, to acknowledge the uncomfortable feelings that we have about being in a bathing suit, but recognize that the value is so much important of getting in a bathing suit and playing with our kids that despite the uncomfort, we're going to get in the bathing suit and play with our kids. Then you also have to do the body image work. And there are some wonderful workbooks that people can work through um, with their, their therapist or on their own. Um, you can do body scans, you can do mirror work um, where you talk about different body parts in either a neutral or a grateful sort of way to start to shift the thoughts and the focus. Okay, just have a few more here. Uh, is there a correlation between ADHD and restricting? Some clients struggle due to their medications not making them hungry. Absolutely. Um, again, that would be a medication-induced side effect. Um, if it's just a medication-induced side effect, that's not an eating disorder, right? If they don't develop the, the fears around body image and, and gaining weight around that, that would just be a medication side effect. For people who are at risk for developing an eating disorder, going into that negative energy balance can absolutely be a way to perpetuate their eating disorder to even start their eating disorder. And we see a significant amount of patients misuse stimulant medications to alter their hunger and fullness cues. Okay, I'll let you go ahead and get back to the presentation and then we can ask these at the end if that works. That would be perfect. Awesome, thanks. So one thing that my patients often will come in talking about is that their outpatient team just doesn't, doesn't know what order to do things that, right. They want to start to do the trauma work, but when they do the trauma work, it sets them back in terms of their eating. And so then their, their treatment providers were really focused on the eating disorder parts of it, behaviors. And they feel like those are under good control. And then they start doing the trauma work and they go backwards again. Um, and so what is kind of the right order to do treatment for, for somebody who has both PTSD and an eating disorder? And there's not really good guidelines about like what to do with that. Um, and so kind of whatever you do is correct. Um, and so it's really figuring out what is best for your individual patient. Um, so kind of this is, again, purely the next slide is just purely my own clinical opinion and what we have kind of decided to do at, at TMR. There absolutely needs to be a level of eating disorder behavior stability. People need to be at a, a minimum weight so that they're nourishing their bodies. We need to be nourishing their, their bodies and their brains at consistent intervals so that their thinking is online. And then once they hit those minimum sort of markers, we really believe we got to start treating both um, the eating disorder and the trauma disorder at the same time to kind of see what happens, right? And we, we are definitely have a luxury of having our patients at inpatient and residential level care where we're with them 24 hours per day and we have staff to support them 24 hours per day. But we know that the eating disorder and PTSD, they, they act on each other, right? So it's a little bit of whack-a-mole for some people. And so we have to really start treating both of those things at the same time for people who have both based on what we have seen at TMR. So there's some research out, out there looking at that. One study was the um, Project Recover. So this was after intensive eating disorder treatment. Um, where they, they hit those minimum guidelines of, you know, I think it was 85% of their ideal body weights and patients were mostly following their meal plans. I think it was about 80% of meal plan adherence any given day. What they did was 16 sessions of CPT um, and they continued the eating disorder interventions, right? So they still had people work with the dietitian, they still did meal coaching, they still monitored weight to make sure things were going. The hope was that they'd be able to maintain eating disorder symptom reduction while also improving PTSD. Um, so it was a very, very small study. What it showed was that nine of the patients using this kind of wraparound services of treating both at the same time actually remitted from their eating disorder behaviors at the beginning of the 16 week trauma sessions. Eight of the nine stayed in remission of their eating disorder behaviors, which is fantastic. Um, five noted no changes in eating disorder thoughts. One patient noted worsening of eating disorder thoughts and three reported improvements. Um, this is not, not unheard of, right? That oftentimes as we start to nourish our bodies and we start to do the trauma work, people will actually oftentimes notice more eating disorder behaviors come up. 
I think that's around those negative um, things that we say about our bodies during trauma, right? And some of those old things will kind of start coming through. The cool thing was that, again, super small study, um, those nine patients no longer met criteria for PTSD either. So um, depending on kind of what your specialty is, gold standard treatment of trauma is really exposure work. And there's lots of different ways to get to that. There's prolonged exposure, there's EMDR. For kiddos, there's trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy that um, does some sessions with with the kiddo alone, some sessions with both of them alone, and some sessions if the parents need it, of parent coaching so that the parents are providing the support that they need. There's cognitive processing therapy, and then there was a developmentally adapted cognitive processing therapy for um, children and adolescents. So prolonged exposure, this is a manualized treatment. They both use um, imaginal and in vivo, in vivo exposure. So imaginal exposure is creating the trauma narrative, trying to remember as much details as they can, going through the narrative between sessions to normalize um, their reactions to um, the narrative that they, they produced. Also remembering that they are safe and vivo exposure is going back into places or things that they, because of the trauma have deemed unsafe that are actually safe, right? So it may be going outside at night if the trauma happened at night. And so with the therapist, they will do a session at, at night in the dark, do grounding skills and all those sorts of things so that over time, the person can start to go back into real life. This helps with both organization because again, a lot of times the first time we'll have somebody do a trauma narrative for prolonged exposure, there may be lots of things missing or things may be in a way that doesn't necessarily make sense, right? Because our, our brain fragments different memories when we're in a, a traumatized sort of state. So helping somebody create a cohesive and narrative over time can be really helpful. It has been found over in studies um, to reduce symptoms of PTSD. Um, prolonged exposure also um, decreases other symptoms, so helps decrease um, depression and anxiety. And again, helps people figure out what things are actually safe, unsafe, and helps them function um, better throughout their lives. EMDR, so this is thinking about a traumatic event while simultaneously um, focusing on an external stimulus. So this may be um, a light bar, this may be finger movements, anything that kind of helps shift their focus just a little bit. Um, past events um, that have laid the ground for, or for dysfunction or process, forming new connections and helping them focus um, and it use adaptive information. Current circumstances that create distress are targeted and both internal and external triggers are desensitized. There's also a future template that can help them um, think about how they were function through and become more adaptive in all different um, contexts. So cognitive processing therapy is another uh, manualized treatment. It's usually 10-ish uh, or 12-ish sessions that have been studied, can be individualized or grouped. There are homework assignments, and this is exposure work, plus looking at maladaptive thought processes around the trauma. Um, so for CPT, there's an impact statement that develop, um, details the current understanding of why the traumatic event occurred, the impact that it has had on beliefs about self, others, and the world. So this is where we really can kind of go in and start to focus on those negative um, thoughts that we may have had, right? That I did something that could have caused this, or I could have prevented it, or now the world in general is unsafe, or I can't trust people. Um, so we start to, to really start processing and, and questioning those events and trying to come up with more balanced statements. This one will also have a trauma narrative um, and go through questioning to help them again come across what those maladaptive um, cognitions are and help them develop safe trusty, trust um, and intimacy in all different areas where the trauma may have affected them. Trauma-focused CBT is for children and adolescents who have done or have had experienced traumas. It's therapy that has both the child and safe people in their lives, right? So the non-offending parent, if there's a parent exposure, um, or both parents, if the trauma was outside of the family unit. 
This also works on exposure. So there's some sort of narrative that's going on. They really work on cognitive restructuring. So again, remind, reminding people that they are safe, um, that the world is usually a safe place. They have trusted adults that they can go to. They work on emotion regulation skills. And this has been found to reduce PTSD symptoms, depression, and increased functioning in both children and adolescents. Um, so the sessions are usually psychoeducation. So they talk about what trauma does um, to the brain, how it can cause different behaviors that people may be seeing. They work with the kids on relaxation, um, on how to regulate emotions, um, also thinking about how um, to cognitively process these different events. And again, it has both um, child sessions alone and adult and children sessions together so that the parents can become a resource for the kiddo. For kids and adolescents with trauma, um, there's been a um, developmentally appropriate CBT that has been modified. There's a commitment phase um, to talk to the kids about really thinking about motivation and that therapeutic alliance. We always talk about how trauma work is really, really challenging. Nobody necessarily wants to do it, um, but that once you get started in it, we really recommend you go through the entire process so that we don't open up something that could cause more distress without putting it back together. Um, there's integration and emotion regulation techniques. So again, skills, skill building is throughout all of this. There's also a part of it as a trauma narrative. And then with developmentally appropriate cognitive processing therapy, they also think about things that are appropriate for where just the, the person should be developmentally, right? So picking a college to go to, um, relationships, how they see themselves, keeping themselves safe, right? Thinking about how the, they may be exposed to offerings of substance use and how that may or may not fit in with their values and how people with trauma sometimes will be more impulsive or not care about themselves in the same way so that they may partake in things that they wouldn't normally do. Another way that we can treat traumas through uh, and treat eating disorders is through medications. Although I always say as a psychiatrist, I always feel like there's this need to talk about medications, but definitely for eating disorders, really gold standard treatment is um, good sustained nutrition, figuring out a way to stop maladaptive eating disorder behaviors, um, and then doing the therapy to get to the underlying issues that cause the development of the eating disorder. PTSD, same way medications can be helpful, but really gold standard treatment is therapy. Medications that are approved for PTSD are both paroxetine and sertraline. Both of these are um, serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Challenging part with these medications is that if somebody has an underlying eating disorder, the way these medications work is they prevent the reuptake of serotonin, serotonin, serotonin in our brains. We still have to be making our own serotonin though, right? And the way we make serotonin is from amino acids. If we're not taking in enough of, of food or not allowing our body to absorb the food, we may not be making enough serotonin for these medications to become effective. For anorexia nervosa, there are no medications that are FDA approved for the core symptoms of it. For bulimia nervosa, there's one medication that is FDA approved and that is fluoxetine. Um, has been found to decrease the number of binging and purging episodes per week. And then for binge eating disorder, there is one medication that is FDA approved and that's Liz Dexamphetamine. Um, this is a medication that we use in ADHD. Um, what the manufacturers will say is that it decreases cognitive impulsivity. So people still may have urges to binge, but they'll be able to use other skills in place of it. The literature on this now goes out for over a year. As long as people stay on the medications, it does seem like it is helpful. There's some controversy of using this particular medication in the eating disorder world. Um, some of us worry that this may be just decreasing hunger cues. Um, but again, some studies look very positive at this medication too. So we talked about all of the gold standard treatments for PTSD or exposure in, in, in nature. And there's usual behaviors that exclude people doing exposure treatment, right? So suicidality is usually an exclusion. Malnutrition is an exclusion. 
Um, Self-injurious behaviors are an exclusion. Aggressive behaviors in, um, in an inpatient or residential treatment elopement tend to be exclusion um, behaviors. So we need some sort of treatment that will help us figure out how to negate all of these things, even though we know when we are doing exposure therapy, we're probably activating people um, so that they're more likely to, to go to some of these maladaptive coping skills. So um, going back to Pilar, her outpatient treatment team, her therapist really wanted to do trauma work, um, but she remained pretty unstable in terms of several behaviors, in terms of eating disorder, non-suicidal self-harm, and um, suicidal ideations that her therapist was like, I can't do this. Um, her therapist was working really closely with her dietitian, which is perfect. And the dietitian was unable to get a patient to be adherent to her meal plan to stop exercising. And her dietitian kept saying she needs trauma therapy um, to get these things under control. And her therapist kept saying she needs better dietary management to get these things under control. And, and both were, were true, right? She needed more support on, on both things, which is why she ended up coming to an inpatient or residential treatment. Um, and again, we've talked about this of like, what's the order that we should be doing things. Um, so again, here we really kind of think about doing things at the same time, because as you can see from Pilar, um, her vicious cycle is that she would start to get behaviors under control by going to an inpatient or residential treatment. She would come out, she would be really focused on following the meal plan. The, her outpatient treatment team would start doing some of the trauma work and then she would destabilize and they would have to put a stop to the trauma work to try to get behaviors under control again. And so this was really, really frustrating for everybody involved, including Pilar. And so what we do at TMR is we really think about what we need in terms of co-treatment. So there needs to be basic nutrition for the brain to work well. There's a minimum kind of percentage of ideal body weight we need people to be at. There's a minimum amount of meal plan adherence that we need people to be going towards. Um, we need to teach them skills that they can use to regulate themselves when they become stressed and ways to kind of cope ahead. And then they really need the trauma work, right? Because the trauma is often pushing some of these maladaptive things that are coming up um, and definitely decreasing functionality. So um, again, we need to prioritize all of these things at the same time. So what we have chosen to use is DBT. And DBT is dialectical behavior therapy. It was first developed by Marsha Linehan to um, treat people with borderline personality disorder. There is a, a new manual. So this is now a manualized treatment of DBT plus prolonged um, exposure to work with people with maladaptive coping skills that need both um, for PTSD. And what this can do is it can help give people the skills that they need to decrease the maladaptive behaviors that often precluded them from exposure work. Um, so DBT treats um, three main targets. So it treats um, life-threatening behaviors. Um, again, these would be absolute contraindications to exposure work. So this is suicidality, non-suicidal self-interest behavior and eating disorder behaviors. It um, also targets therapy interfering behavior. So these may be possible contraindications to exposure work. And then last part of it, it also talks about quality of life issues. So DBT um, includes individual therapy where this is once they have done the skills and group work where they're learning the skills, the individual therapist helps them put it into practice into their actual real life work. They talk about places where it did work, didn't work, and how to finesse the skills. There's DBT coaching. Um, so in the outpatient world, right, this would be telephone calls or texting of like, hey, I'm in this situation. These are the skills I already used. I can't think of what to do next. The therapist will say, well, what about using X, Y, or Z skill? Then the patient will, will put that into practice. At inpatient or residential, we are really lucky that we have people here 24 hours a day. And so we've trained our behavioral health techs to be able to do DBT coaching. So they will, um, they have a diary card and they'll look at what the patient has used um, and make suggestions on what skill to try next. If that doesn't work, then they can call the on-call therapist who will help with that. And then this consultation team, this is really important for us as therapists, psychiatrists, working with these patients, right? They tend to be very, very ill patients. Um, they tend to drop out of treatment. They tend to, to take a lot of resources. They tend to, tend to um, 
they tend to, to have a lot of things that can be scary for us who are working with them, right? And so we really need a team that we can go to to get the support that we need to be able to continue to work with highly dysregulated patients. So the four main modules of DBT are mindfulness, which is staying in the present moment, <clears throat> interpersonal effectiveness, which is good communication, emotion regulation, which is how do we set ourselves up to have a good day emotionally? If we're not having the greatest day emotionally, how we can make it better, decrease the intensity of emotions. And then distress tolerance is how do we cope when we can't problem solve, where oftentimes we'll pick things that would make things worse, right? So this would be a situation where and you're feeling really distressed, the only thing that you typically know how to do is maybe self-harm or restrict. This gives a whole bunch of other skills that people can use that will keep themselves safe until they can problem solve. So um, again, we can use DBT to help prep for prolonged exposure. Um, starting in 2010, there were some studies actually looking at DBT and prolonged exposure to see this. Um, what they found is they used a study of 51 women with PTSD and borderline personality disorder who had at least one definitive exclusion from doing prolonged um, exposure. So that could have been the self-harm, the suicidality, maladaptive eating skills. This was a full DBT or comprehensive DBT study. So they had all components. They had the skills in a group setting. They had individual therapy. They had the consultation team for the therapist and they had the coaching. And by the end of um, treatment, 68% um, percent of these patients met criteria to be able to go on to do prolonged exposure, which is fantastic, particularly with patients with borderline personality disorder who often don't stick in treatment um, within that. So um, another study looked at 93 patients with PTSD plus at least three symptoms of borderline personality disorder. They were either randomized to cognitive processing therapy alone, which we know is a gold standard treatment for PTSD, or cognitive processing therapy plus DBT, and they were followed out for 15 months. And what you can see is that um, the dropout rates for the group that had the DBT plus were lower, symptomatic recovery was higher for patients that also had DBT, improvement was greater for people who had CBT plus DBT, and recovery was greater for people who had um, DBT. And this was a 2020 study. Um, there is now a manual that again is out there for both DBT and prolonged exposure that combines the two of it. So we also know that in addition to DBT being helpful for people with trauma, DBT is also helpful for people with eating disorders. Um, we know, so DBT thinks about the biosocial theory, right? That there's this biological predisposition to being more emotionally sensitive. And once we are stimulated with a, with a stimulus, we have a larger reaction and it takes a longer time to come back down to baseline. The way that they've adapted this with food is looking at a genetic vulnerability to that same emotional dysregulation and then food plays some sort of emotional pacifier. So again, restriction can kind of tamper down all emotions and make us more numb. People that are binge eating um, sometimes will get kind of brief episodes of relief with the binge eating and with purging again, some people will get brief episodes of relief. There's an invalidating environment. Most of us who are living with the Western ideal, um, there's an over-concern of body um, weight and image just in our society. Um, people may be teased by family or friends about what they're eating or not eating or what their bodies look like too. And so DBT for eating disorders has looked at, there's been a couple of different studies out there that have shown that DBT is effective for um, particularly bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder. Um, there's other studies out there that look at eating disorders plus people with borderline personality disorder. We know that people who have an eating disorder plus borderline personality disorder who seek treatment, um, their eating disorder pathology tends to be more severe. They tend to need more inpatient and residential levels of treatment. They tend to have more co-occurring conditions um, and it tends to impact their, their eating disorder course. Um, what we could see is that DBT plus um, traditional eating disorder behaviors um, were helpful, that there was greater um, both um, greater 
recovery in terms of eating disorder behaviors, people also stayed in treatment longer periods of time and people's borderline personality disorder also got better. Um, there's a focus on with DBT of more patient responsibility. There's a more flexible and collaborative stance within terms of treatment of the eating disorder interventions. We really like to get creative with people and we really work to increase positive life experiences during treatment um, for this. So again, this was a small study looked at um, a very kind of small sample size of this, but six of the seven actually stayed in treatment for the entire six month period of time. Again, that's really um, effective. We know that staying in treatment is really important for helping people recover. Um, four of the underweight patients gained weight, five reported less restriction, two had no changes. Um, three who had engaged in abstinent were, um, or who engaged in binge eating were absent at the time of treat, at the end of treatment. Six who purged um, were absent of purging at, at the end of treatment. For non-suicidal self-interest behaviors, five of them decreased behaviors. One had no change and one actually had an increase in change or an increase in self-interest behavior. Therapy interfering behaviors decreased over time, which again, helps us be more creative um, of helping match people where they are. It also prevents burnout on the team. Um, Cause again, as therapists or psychiatrists, we really like feeling effective and like we were helping people. So decreasing those therapy interfering behaviors are great for everybody. Um, therapy interfering behaviors. So there's eating disorder specific ones and then there's other treatment interfering ones. The nice thing is, is that DBT can really help um, target all of those different behaviors. As you can see, a lot of those behaviors would be things that um, if somebody needed exposure work would be excluders from doing exposure work. So outpatient um, implementation, what studies have found is that there's increase in weight restoration, decrease in eating disorder behaviors, less hospital admissions need, increased retention and um, follow through with patients, increased medical stability, decreased suicidal and non-suicidal self-interest behaviors, Patients feel more collaborative with the treatment team. There's a greater willingness um, to work on eating disorder behaviors. They're able to express emotions more adaptively. Clinicians reported feeling greater support um, and less burnout, which are again, are all wins. So going back to Pilar, she again was admitted to um, our unit. We have lots of structure, right? Which helped her stop restriction. Um, she initially did need a nasogastric tube initially but we were able to transition her within three or four days to full oral intake. Um, again, we're very structured, so she was unable to exercise. We optimized medications, so sertraline or Zoloft was increased in, um, to maximum treatment dose to target both dysphoric mood and also PTSD symptoms. There was a small dose of Zyprexa or Olanzapine that was added both for agitation. She has some set shifting difficulties, which is a measure of cognitive rigidity that we often see with people with eating disorders. And she had significant dissociation. Um, we used a lot of DBT to help decrease non-suicidal self-harm urges and suicidal ideations. Um, she was in the middle of some trauma work, individualized trauma work, and she actually did have a regression where she self-harmed once with hitting her head up against a tree. At that point in time, all trauma work ceased for a period of time. Um, we really went back and really worked very hard with her on using the DBT skills and increased her um, ability to cope more effectively. And that got her back into um, both individual trauma work and a group trauma work pro um, program called Survivors Week, which works on developmental trauma using inner child work and functional adult work. She had some intermittent restricting early on in treatment. Um, when she would do this, her therapist would move the trauma section to the next day um, with the contingency that she needed to complete her meal plan in order to continue to do the trauma work. Um, she was also, we did some family sessions with her husband, because if you will remember earlier, her husband had made comments about her body at times and some of her eating disorder behaviors as being disgusting. 
Um, so we helped him come up with a better way of, of talking about things so that he still was able to express his displeasure when she would act on these behaviors or be less um, than honest with her behaviors, um, but to do it in a less shaming sort of way. She was able to um, get through one of the targets with the EMDR, able to complete Survivor's Week, able to fully weight restore. And the plan is for her to discharge and continue care with her psychiatrist, her therapist to continue EMDR work as an outpatient and um, to continue working with a registered dietitian. And um, my references are here if anybody has questions and I will open it up to questions from the group. Okay, we have a lot of questions. Uh, let's see, the first one is increasing research is revealing the physically addictive nature of many processed, high fat, high refined sugar foods. How do you differentiate between a physical addiction stemming from the types of food being ingested and an eating disorder? Could it be that some binge eating behavior is actually a response to food addiction? So the way we think of food at TMR is that we don't think of food addiction. Um, it, we know that there's hyper palatable foods out there that people are, have a harder time negotiating and, and affect our brains in a different way so that we don't feel our hunger and fullness cues. That being said, we are an all foods fit program. And so we still expose people to those different foods to see how they are responding to, to those different foods. When we really seem to be breaking down, at least for the patients that we treat at the Meadows Ranch, binge eating, it seems to be not about just hyper palatable food. We will talk to people that binge on hyper palatable food, but also binge on other things that are available in, in their homes, including things that aren't hyper palatable, like carrot sticks or hummus um, and those sorts of foods too. It really appears to be, again, kind of a, a brain disorder with emotion dysregulation and being the core to that. Okay, um, let's see. Is there any correlation between eating disorders and OCD? Absolutely. So um, how I talked about set shifting difficulties. So set shifting is a difficulty with cognitive rigidity. Um, one way to test for this is that you look at those pictures where like you should be able to see multiple different images in them. People with set shifting difficulties will have a harder time seeing those, those multiple different images. There is definitely a correlation between obsessive compulsive disorder and particularly restrictive eating disorders and compulsive exercise. And so for those patients, they, they need both of those things treated at the same time because those two things can really glob onto each other and feed each other. The eating disorder can become part of the OCD sorts of rituals. For there, they need <clears throat> oftentimes, they, they definitely need nutrition stabilization, right? They need their brains to be well nourished. They oftentimes need medication support and they need exposure therapy, exposure response prevention therapy. Okay. Uh, any thoughts on the impact of the ongoing pandemic and eating disorder rates? Absolutely. Um, so we know, particularly with children and adolescents, and I think this is just because right now we have better studies with that, that eating disorder rates and, and hospitalizations, ER visits have definitely increased with um, the pandemic, I make up that we all felt like life was a little bit out of control for a period of time and we didn't know what was going to happen next. And eating disorders, for a lot of people at their core, are about a sense of control and being able to control something. Um, and so we saw rates definitely spike um, with the pandemic. Do you see or know of any relationships between a parent with an eating disorder and a child having an eating disorder? Yeah, absolutely. So we know that eating disorders have a large amount of heritability. So we know there's a genetic influence there, right? That people with an eating disorder have certain genes that make their brains think certain ways are affected differently by negative energy balance. And there's also the system that they grow up in, right? The environmental function. So if somebody sees mom or dad always, you know, thinking about and making remarks about their body and limiting their food or, or thinking about their food a lot um, or, or their movement patterns. There's also the behavioral component that the young person may adapt to. Um, 
Very true. Um, let's see here. Can traumatic experiences that are completely forgotten due to dissociation still play a role in severe eating disorders as a subconscious behavior and belief? And if so, what are the best modalities to go about remembering and processing through forgotten trauma without causing the ED behaviors to become even more severe? Yeah, so absolutely. I mean, I think probably many people have read The Body Keeps the Score. And so even if we don't have conscious memories of trauma, our, our bodies remember. And for some people, even pre-language traumas, right, can affect relationships and affect the relationships that they have with themselves. I, I'm not sure if they necessarily need to remember everything that happened within the trauma, but they need to do the work about um, feeling comfortable in their own body, fully reintegrating into their body and figuring out ways to cope with those, those sensations that they're having that puts them at risk for acting and eating disorder behaviors. Wow. This is fascinating. Um, is there a book or workbook you recommend for aging women accepting body image age-related issues? That applies to me too. <laughs> that's a great question. And off the top of my head, I, I don't know one that specifically addresses both of those things, but I, I, I would think there's one out there. Let's see. How do you treat PTSD specifically? So you use um, an exposure modality, right? So that would be using the prolonged exposure, EMDR, um, cognitive processing therapy, or in kids using trauma-focused CBT. You can also use medications. Again, I think the necessary component is the therapy for people that are either too anxious or their symptoms are too severe. You can use medications also, and that would be sertraline. Um, or paroxetine are the two FDA approved medications. Let's see here. Um, do eating disorders occur independent of trauma and how common is the co-occurrence of trauma with eating disorders and why might exposure to trauma manifest in the manner of an eating disorder and distorted body image? So yes, absolutely. Eating disorders happen all the time separately from, from people that have had trauma, right? We have people who have absolutely no trauma who develop eating disorders. Um, as you saw in one of the slides, about a third of people, a third to a fourth of patients with eating disorders would also meet criteria for um, PTSD. And then we spoke at length about all of the reasons why trauma can can change our relationship with how we feel about our bodies, how we see the world. Can an eating disorder can help us gain a sense of control after trauma when we felt really out of control too. Wonderful. Well, folks, I'm going to jump in. Thank you again so much, Dr. Garber, uh, for spending your time here for this wonderful presentation. The chat is just filled with all kinds of complimentary comments, um, mm -hmm. a lot of great information, and I know this is going to help not only a lot of the clinicians and professionals on the call, but those that they serve as well. So we just really appreciate you, you know, donating your time here today to share this information with us. Um